What's up everyone? Welcome to part two of our deep learning concepts tutorial series. And in this one, we're going to talk about activation functions. So we'll explain what an activation function is, what the different types are, and what exactly they're used for and what their purpose is. So let's get started. Let's start by explaining what an activation function is. So an activation function is a nonlinear function which decides if the output from a neuron is important and should be propagated forward or not. So if the output from our neuron is high enough, then the activation function will activate and that output will propagate forward. If the output's low, then that output is not important and it probably won't propagate forward and have much effect in our network. So think of a threshold or a switch or something that's deciding is this information important or not. If the output's high enough, then it's important. If it's low enough or if it's too low, then it's not important and won't really propagate and have much effect. So that's a basic overview of what a activation function is. So how important are these activation functions and do we really need them in our neural networks? And the answer is yes, they are very important and we do need them. So without them, our neural network would just be doing linear regression. So we'd only be able to model linear equations and linear events. So while linear regression is important, um, we want to do more than that. We want to be able to solve nonlinear equations and nonlinear events. So these activations give us the power to do that. So yes, they're very important and we want to make sure our models, our neural networks have them. Now let's look at some of the more popular activation functions. So I'm not going to go over all of them. We'll skip some of the simple ones like the identity and the binary step activation, mainly because we never see these. But we're going to look at the three most popular ones. So the first one is going to be the sigmoid. So the sigmoid, you can see, has a shape. looks like a little S-curve, but it starts at zero in the negative values and then increases with this sort of S-slope and then flattens out to a value of one for high positive values. So the way an activation function works is think of the x-axis or the horizontal axis, that's your input, and then the vertical is your output. So if you had an input of zero, you'd have an output of uh, one half. And if you had an input of like something really large, like 10 or greater than 10, the output's always gonna be one. And if you had a negative value, a really large negative value, the output's always going to be zero. So that's how an activation works. But the problem with the sigmoid was, like I described here, when you have an input of zero, you have an output that's not zero. You have an output that's a half. And that's not what we want. We want something that's going to give us a zero output when the input zero. So that's why the tan h became a more popular activation function. So this one has a similar shape as the sigmoid function, but now it's centered at zero. So you can see here, it starts at minus one, and then once we get to zero, the output is zero, and then we have a similar curve from zero to one. So this became a more popular activation function, but the problem with the tan age and the sigmoid is they flatten out in the plus or negative direction. So you can see the slope of the line pretty much goes to zero. Once we cross like say just a few integers, positive or negative, the slope is gonna go to zero. So this is what's called the vanishing gradient. So we'll talk about this more later, but the activation function that helps correct that is called ReLU. So ReLU or rectified linear is a pretty simple activation function. As you can see, if the input is negative, the output's going to be zero. And if the input is positive, then the output is going to be the same value as the input. So it's zero centered. So if we have an input of zero, we get an output of zero. And the main advantage of this is it doesn't have a vanishing gradient. So what I mean by that is let me jump over and show you a plot of all the gradients. So this has a big impact on why we choose ReLU over the other ones. So here you can see a plot of the gradients of all three activation functions, sigmoid in blue, tanH in orange, and ReLU in green. 
So you can see for sigmoid and tan H, for large negative and large positive values, the gradient goes to zero. Whereas ReLU, for large positive values, the gradient maintains a value of one. So why is this important? Well, for the deeper layers in our network, the output can grow. It can be, um, it can grow outside these ranges. So when we try and train our network, if the gradient goes to zero, then our back propagation is going to struggle to optimize those points or those weights or those parts of our network. So ideally, we don't want the gradient to go to zero. So that's the advantage of ReLU. It doesn't have a zero gradient, so it works good for those deep layers, especially the ones later on where the, where the output and inputs can, can be greater or can be outside this range here. So yeah, that's where the ReLU becomes really important. Um, one note about ReLU is that you can see here that for negative values, the gradient is zero. So this can be a problem in the early stages of training because typically you might have random weights assigned in our network. And if those weights are assigned to negative values, you could have some input into the activation function that's negative, And then boom, you've got a zero gradient and you're kind of stuck. So this is where leaky ReLU comes in. Leaky ReLU, instead of having a, instead of it being zero for negative values, it'll have a slightly, a slightly positive slope. So just a small um, slope here. So that way, if we do get some um, weights that are initialized to negative values or inputs that are initialized to negative values, it, you're able to still train. And also things like dropout can also be helpful. Random dropout can help drop out these um, activations that get randomly set to negative values and then they get stuck. So we can just drop those out. But it's a random process, so it still isn't perfect. So leaky ReLU can be helpful for that. So to wrap everything up, the ideal activation function for the majority of your layers is going to be either ReLU or leaky ReLU. The reason being it's zero centered and it doesn't suffer from the vanishing gradient problem. And finally, for your final layer, like your final output layer, the activation that you're going to use is going to be something like sigmoid or a softmax because we want something that's going to normalize it, our outputs to either zero or one, somewhere in that range. We're not going to use ReLU for the final one because the outputs always want to be from zero to one. So in summary, ReLU for everything except for the final output layer where you're going to use softmax or sigmoid. So that's going to do it for this video. I hope you found it useful and have a better understanding of activation functions so you can better use them in your models. And if you have any comments, please leave them below. Um, I'll try my best to answer them. And in the next one, we'll look at some other layers or some other concepts in deep learning. So see you guys in the next one and peace.